Uh, but thanks for joining us today, guys. We've got a great webinar, uh, Why Doctors Should Outsource Their Billing. Now, if you're looking into getting our business, uh, which is teaching people how to do medical billing for doctors, you'll find it very interesting to hear from an actual medical doctor today, Dr. Vicki Ratner. Start by introducing her. She is a retired general surgeon who actually outsourced her own billing. Uh, she'll tell you a little bit more about that here in a moment. And she's also a nationally noted expert, an author, and a speaker. Uh, she's appeared on various uh, dozens of radio and television programs and articles have appeared in a number of magazines and newspaper about her and by her. And during her career, she treated tens of thousands of patients as a surgeon, and she held a clinical faculty appointment at the same time at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Uh, she left the operating room to help doctors, and now she works directly with business professionals like yourself, if you get involved in our business, uh, to help them partner more effectively with, with physicians. And so uh, she's here today to uh, talk a little bit more about that. She's written a number of books that I have showing there on the screen. Her latest one uh, that you can find on Amazon is The Myth of the Rich Doctor. Uh, and it's a wonderful book, by the way. We're gonna show you how to get a free copy of that at the end of this webinar. See, it's a cliffhanger, hang in there and you'll know more about that. She's also uh, a medical expert and writes regularly for Physicians Money Digest on the web. And she's also the medical director of the Medical Revenue Management Association of America. So, Dr. Ragnar, are you there with us today? I am. Thanks for inviting me, Patrick. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thanks for joining us, Dr. Ragnar. I thought we would start today uh, by just talking a little bit about, you know, the whole subject of why doctors should be outsourcing their billing. Can you kind of give us a little background as to how you got into medicine? I think it's fascinating, your story, and you might want to share that with people. All right. Well, I'll just tell the short version of it. So I was actually planning on being a physicist. I was in a graduate program when one day I fainted on my way to the bathroom. Um, I was bleeding internally. And by the time the surgeons got into my belly, about half of my blood volume was in my belly. So I really thought this was the end. Oh, my goodness. I was so grateful to wake up in the recovery room. I just knew I was going to be a doctor and save other people's lives like my own had been saved. And that's probably explains why I became a surgeon. So, you know, I, I'm a boomer. And so I'm part of the generation that never really wanted to have a boss. I wanted to be my own boss. So when I got out of my training, I like about 80% of my colleagues went into private practice. I actually joined another fellow and um, I took call it two hospitals. And the second hospital, sort of my secondary um, hospital, um, decided to start a multidisciplinary breast clinic. So I decided that I was going to move my practice and uh, function primarily out of that other office. Now as a solo surgeon in private practice. And I'd had enough experience with billing and all sorts of other issues with my first colleague that there was one thing I was absolutely clear about. I was going to outsource my billing. You see, this gentleman had done his own in-house billing. And um, I suspect in retrospect that the reason that his office manager didn't really like me was that maybe I was gonna uncover some embezzlement issues that were going on there. Um, so he brought in his wife to do the billing. How hard can it be after all? And it was just a total nightmare that totally disrupted the cash flow. So I just knew that I was going to outsource the billing. You know, I didn't try to do my own taxes. I had the tax experts do it. And I knew how critical cash flow was. And in retrospect, that's probably the best decision that I made. So, you know, as a serial entrepreneur, I'm trying to put myself in your shoes, wondering, gee, is this a real viable business opportunity? Is this, you know, something that's going to get outsourced to China or India, you know, in the next three years? And right. can I be successful? And I will just tell you that from my experience helping doctors achieve the personal, professional and financial rewards that attracted them to a career in medicine, you're in exactly the right place and the right time. This is a real business opportunity that's positioned for growth. Yeah, well, thank you. That's a that's a great excuse for uh, people to uh, you know uh, not have to question in their own minds, you know, 
do doctors really need to outsource their billing? Uh, because obviously from your own experience uh, with some uh, embezzlement going on there, there's probably more of that than we realize going on out there, huh? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of paradoxical because, you know, doctors like being in control. And, you know, intuitively, it sort of makes sense that if you're doing your in-house billing, that's a way of being in control. But in fact, that's very vulnerable. You know, outsourcing your billing with checks and balances is really the best way to stay in control. Yeah. Um, well, I thought we'd also talk a little bit about burnout. That's a big problem right out, out, out there right now with doctors, isn't it? And depression. <laughs> it really is. So the situation is that, you know, most doctors want to be a doctor because they want to help people. They want to serve people. And when I was coming out of my residency, I mean, every doctor was going to succeed financially. But the whole landscape of healthcare has changed and is continuing to change. And what that means is that in order to be successful, you've got to pay attention to the business side of medicine. But the problem is that we doctors don't get any training in the business side of medicine. So a lot of them are sort of feeling like they have to do things harder and faster just to keep from getting behind. And this is not working out very well. This is causing a tremendous amount of stress. And we are seeing epidemic rates of burnout among doctors. I mean, if you take a look, about 40% of doctors right now are burned out. Mm. This has never been seen before. Doctors are dealing with toxic stress. And if you look at the causes of the stress, it's not that, you know, I just don't like seeing patients anymore. Patrick, in the next slide, a Medscape survey sort of lays it out. They're dealing with too many bureaucratic tasks, including billing, spending too many hours at work. Um, they, they're seeing the computerization of their practice. They're feeling like a cog in the wheel. They feel like they've lost their autonomy. And it's interesting because if you really think about this, this is them responding to the business side of medicine. They didn't go to medical school to manage the business side of medicine. And when burned out doctors are asked, like, what would you need to be better? And on the next slide, it shows that the number one thing that they say is increased compensation to avoid financial stress. So in other words, what ABS offers is a business in a box sort of that will help you go out and deal with virtually every single one of those problems that doctors say are contributing to their burnout, plus the solution, ways to reduce your burnout. So you have a chance of meeting a doctor who may be deciding, you know what, I'm just gonna hang it up. I, I just don't have it in me to do this anymore or is in despair. And you can help that doctor turn around their practice, run a profitable practice, help them get more joy, help them be able to contribute to the community so that the community starts growing. I mean, this is really sort of a win, win, win. You're doing well by doing good. Yeah, that first one there is the, is the biggest thing. And it says it's increased compensation to avoid financial stress. That would take away some of their burnout. Well, that's what our business is really all about. It's just helping the doctor get more money, uh, all the money that they're due uh, when they build Medicare and, and insurance companies and their patients. Getting as much of that back in as they can would solve a lot of that uh, stress that they have. Uh, yes. So if I might just point out, Patrick, um, the national data, now you shared this with me, the national data shows that doctors only collect about 70% of what they're owed. So what if, you know, what if your current employer, even if it's yourself, only paid you 70% of what you're earning? My right. guess is you wouldn't be very happy and you would do something about it. You would speak up. But unfortunately, yeah. doctors just don't do that. They say, ah, oh, well, you know, 30% of my claims are rejected. It's just a tax write-off. I'll just let it go. Right. Or, you know, nobody in the office finds time to follow up on it. 
So for many doctors, it's not like they've got to see more patients to increase their compensation. I mean, it makes more sense just to collect what you're owed yet because doctors are not business minded. They don't really think about it. So this is part of the value that you can bring to doctors. Look, doctor, there's a way of, of getting com compensated more without having to work harder. What if we just help you do things in a smarter way? Yeah, and, and our licensees, because our rejection rate through our cloud-based system is uh, less than 2%, that means that we can collect up to 98% of that money that they're billing for. So you're right, they they bill for, say, $100, but they only collect 70 uh, overall because uh, of the rejection rate and the other problems. Look, when doctors think about it, they, they're not necessarily uh, supposed to dwell on the business side of their practice. Uh, they should focus on, you know, the, the, the helping patients. That's what they got into medicine for, but they have to bill and do that to, you know, get the money that's uh, owed to them because most doctors are still billing insurance and uh, Medicare. Very few are on a, you know, pure cash basis. Uh, well, all right, so that is good data, good information. Folks, I hope you are getting that handout so that you can show a spouse or partner some of the great stuff that uh, Dr. Vicki's sharing here with us. Uh, I got a great quote here from Medical Economics Magazine. Uh, this one is, uh, well, it was back in July of last year, but look, it says, if you operate a medical practice, you should be outsourcing. I mean, they're pretty straightforward about it. Uh, as if giving your key employees menial tasks isn't enough to consider outsourcing, the ever-changing landscape of the medical industry should be the deciding factor. And really, a lot is changing right now in the, in the sure medical, medical industry. <laughs> yes. uh, and when it says menial tasks, it means to give the task of actually cre creating a medical claim and submitting it to an insurance company compared to what that staff member could be doing. Aren't there a whole lot of better things that staff could be doing inside the office? Well, I think most people go into a career in medicine because they want to help patients enjoy optimal health. And you know, taking care of billing does not really help a patient achieve optimal health. Right. So that's where the priority is. And remember, doctors are being asked to see more and more patients if they're just on the hamster wheel, just trying to not get further behind. So they're being forced to do more with less. And so taking care of the business side of medicine generally just goes to the bottom of the list. So, yeah. you know, that sort of explains why doctors are willing to walk away from, you know, 30% of their revenue. Well, I'm sure they get checks in probably every day from an insurance company or from Medicare, right? So they look right. at that and go, oh, well, I've got everything under control because money's coming in. What they don't realize is only 70% of what could be coming in, you know? Right, exactly. Uh, here was a 2016 uh, Deloitte survey that was in this article, and it said 59% these are doctors who responded outsource to cut costs. Uh, and so we're going to show another chart here in just a moment, folks. If you're wondering, well, isn't it cheaper for a doctor to do this on their own inside their own office using their own staff? The answer is a big no. Uh, you'll see that here in a second. 57% outsource to focus on their core business, which is helping patients get well. And more than 50% of the respondents noted that outsourced services added value in business case development, strategic assessment, contracting, and more. <laughs> so anyway, we got some good quotes here. This, this one article had a lot. Here's, here's the last part of it. Almost 80% of the survey participants felt positive about their respective outsourcing relationships. In other words, doctors, look folks, the only kind of doctors you'll find out there are the doctors who do it themselves, or who've already decided, oops, I knocked the microphone, <laughs> or who've already decided to outsource it, right? And so uh, that means that doctors are outsourcing and 80% of them are very happy about that. When it comes to outsourcing for your medical practice, whether for IT management, billing processes, et cetera, it not only frees up your employees' time to work on the tasks they were hired for, but it also un unkinks your cash flow. I like that. That cash flow is what it's all about, right? Yeah, now that's not a word that doctors use. The words that they use are things like, I need to pay my payroll, or I need to write a tuition check. Where's the money for that? Right, right, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so 
We had three questions that I had here uh, that I thought we'd cover as we go into this, uh, Dr. Ragnar. Uh, three important questions about you know the doctor's reality, what's really happening out there, the doctor's financial pain that they're feeling, and of course the opportunities for the people that are on the webinar today. So I'll we'll share that. Now here's that chart that I was just referring to. Let me make sure that this thing is as big as I can get it here on your screen because folks, this is a very important comparison between a doctor doing their own billing in-house versus outsourcing. For example, our licensees are charging an average of about 6% for the money that's collected for the doctor. So on a $100 uh, invoice or, or a claim that they send in, the licensee is going to make 6% of that or you know, $6. Uh, so if you multiply 20 claims a workday, that's pretty simple for a doctor to see 20 patients a day, isn't it, Dr. Ragnar? Yes, I would think. Uh, at $100 times 6%, you're only going to, the doctor's only going to pay the outsourced uh, company in a year's time, $31,200. But look at the costs that are in there if the doctor's doing it in-house. They have the in-house in billing employees. We've, we've added uh, one and a half employees at this particular uh, thing. Payroll taxes, you've got workers' comp, errors and omissions insurance, training costs, uh, leave coverage, you know, for vacation and so forth. All the employee benefits and the hardware and the software and the IT support. Uh, all that adds up and is probably a whole lot more than that. But as you can see, the bottom line is folks, a doctor can spend uh, more than twice what it costs to outsource uh, doing it themselves. Dr. Vigini, anything there seem out of whack to you or does that sound all about normal? It All of this sounds normal, but I mean, I think that the way I looked at it was look, I don't do my own taxes. There's, you know, like a hundred thousand pages of tax law, like literally it's too complicated right. and I don't want to invest my time becoming a CPA. Medical billing is becoming increasingly complex. There was just a new diagnostic and procedure code set that came out. It's so complicated that they deferred rolling it out for an entire year while people geared up for the complexity. Yeah. And you know, who do you want handling a complex job, whether it's doing your taxes or, you know, installing a new bathroom in your house? Generally, it's it's most cost effective to go to the experts Expert. who are doing it, who do it day in and day out. And I think you know, especially with this new coding system that is coming out, doctors are really getting, this is complex. You know, I'd probably yeah. be best off putting this in the hands of an expert. Yeah, the coding thing is what concerns a lot of people looking into this business. And uh, folks, we're having a webinar next week that we'll give you a link to here later about that very topic, how to start your own medical billing company without a coding or billing background or training. Uh, because nowadays, cloud-based systems like ours have all that code, you know, built into it. So the doctors just uh, tell what's wrong with the patient and what they're going to do for the patient. And all of a sudden, our system suggests a number of codes that they can select from to uh, actually bill on. So it's 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 all totally automated nowadays. Okay, so Dr. Vicki, let's start with this first question here. What are some of the realities facing doctors out there? All right. Well, the reality is is that doctors are experiencing stress. Many of them experience toxic stress. That's what we call burnout. And unfortunately, they don't really have the resources to deal with these problems in a logical, rational way. Now, you are business-minded. You're sort of wired like an entrepreneur. You know how the world of business works. But this is something that is relatively unfamiliar, uncharted territory for doctors. We do not take a single class in marketing or finance in medical school or residency. Right. And here we are dealing with some basic business problems like client acquisition. You know, doctors call it how to get more patients. Um, but so they've got these really severe problems and they lack the resources to really solve them. Now, what happens to doctors like me who never wanted to be their own boss? Well, they see limited options. They see the options of, okay, well, maybe, I've, uh, maybe I can retire now, 
or maybe I'll just sell my practice to the hospital or clinic, but no doctor who wants to be their own boss wants to do that. That's like literally selling out. Yeah. So you are the third option, you know, outsourcing billing, getting some help with the business management is a solution that works really, really well for doctors who sort of feel painted into a corner. Yes, and you know, you you said to one time to me, Dr. Vicki, that uh, you had a secret sauce. You work with uh, financial planners, right, all across the country that like to connect with doctors and do business with them. Uh, and and I love this. You know, you say that your your specialty is characterizing the differences between the world of medicine and the world of business. There, there's a huge difference. There really is. And I've thought about this for a long, long time because you know, doctors are smart. You'd think that they'd be able to figure it out. But I think temperamentally, doctors are fundamentally wired differently than business-minded people. So let's think about this for a second. If you're a business person, what's the metric by which you measure success? It's your profitability, right? It's your bottom line. For doctors, though, there's a medical ethic that the care a patient gets should be independent of a patient's ability to pay. So we don't talk about money. It's a taboo topic. The metric by which doctors measure success is the way in which they serve patients. So how many patients have I seen? You know, what have their patient outcomes been? So in the world of medicine, it's profit in the world, in the world of medicine, it's service in the world of business, it's profit. Now, both need to pay attention to both things, because if you're not serving your doctor clients, you're not going to get more clients. <laughs> but right. the primary metric is different, and, and people approach things differently. There was another really weird thing. When I made my transition from being a practicing surgeon to being an entrepreneur, you know, people started talking to me, to me about these non-disclosure agreements, NDAs. Like, um, and in the world of business, you wanna get the competitive edge. So what do you wanna do? You wanna guard your best ideas and not share it with anybody. But in the world of medicine, like it is completely different. Doctors wanna share their very best ideas to help their colleagues. So one of the great things about working with doctors is that if you do a really good job for a doctor, they're gonna tell their buddies about you in the doctor's dining room or the surgeon's lounge. So you're not gonna be a best kept secret among doctors because we're sort of naturally wired to share really great resources with um, our colleagues. So it makes it easier to build a referral-based practice than it would be if say you were dealing with small business owners. So there are the, just the way that doctors, the culture of doctors works is different than the way you might think, but it shows how and why they need you. And it also shows how you can sort of do like a martial arts and go with the flow of it to help you build that doctor practice. Yeah, it's amazing how, as you talk about all these things, uh, it even dawns on me from from time to time that our, our licensees who get into this business are actually helping doctors to thrive in medical practice. That's why, you know, we wrote the book that we'll talk about here a little bit, a little bit further. But folks, uh, I'm having to move along here because we're about halfway through the hour here. So I'm just going to continue on by showing another quote here from uh, a company called Black Book Research. Uh, Doug Brown is the managing partner. He says, rising healthcare expenditures and the complex technology uh, or staffing requirements creates an urgent demand for cost-effective outsourcing solutions in physician practices across the country. So it's not just me and it's not just Dr. Ragnar. We're both authorities in this field, but we're, we're giving you these other quotes here. So you see that there are other people who said, uh, similar things that we're saying uh, about the outsourcing situation. Except Look, this... you're much more handsome, Patrick. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. You mean this guy here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this one says the U.S. market for physician billing outsourcing is expected to report an overall. Now, get this, folks. Write this down or get the handout over there in the handout section. 42% growth rate over the period of uh, 
quarter four of 2016 to quarter one of 2019. Okay, so Patrick, I really want to comment on this because yeah. think about all of the businesses that have gone out of business. Schwinn Bicycle, you know, you want to invest in, in a value proposition that's growing. There is growth in healthcare. This is career security. Uh, that's a good point. I, I love that example that you gave there, Swin. Who would have thought? Swin Bikes, they've been around since I was a little boy, uh, went out of business. And there's a whole list I have in another newsletter that I get of all these famous uh, big companies going out of business. You don't have to worry about this one, folks. If you're getting into a business, at least, whether it's this one or any other, make sure that the growth rate is, you know, has got some kind of future to it. And I, I don't see how this one could do anything but grow. Um, Oh, this is 96% of practice leaders report inefficient billing processes. Yeah. And you experienced that uh, yourself there with the other doctor. Uh, here's a, a good one. 51% of new outsourcing clients reported decreased number of rejected claims, as we told you earlier. Most outsourcing companies can do that, at least somewhat. And decreased time that it takes to receive payment from a payer within two months uh, beginning their outsourcing implementation. Folks, our licensees can actually get money in for a doctor in as little as seven days, an average of about 14. But on average out there, doctors are waiting, you know, 30 to 45 days to get checks. So we can even increase uh, the, the speed. And then lastly, 100% of all practices electing to outsource in 2016 noted dropping collections and the time to collect. In other words, they didn't have to go after the money as much because they outsourced it to somebody who, who knows how to get it up front and doesn't have to chase after it. Okay, here's your second question then, Dr. Ragnar. What are some of the financial pains that are facing doctors out there? Well, we don't quite know what the future of the Affordable Care Act is. We still don't know. No. But what I believe is that the things that cause financial pain for doctors will continue whether or not the Affordable Care Act is replaced and repealed, which is unlikely. So the things that contributed to the doctor burnout, we're not going back. We're not gonna go back from the electronic medical record or any of the other issues that are real problems for doctors. In addition, doctors are facing just basic business problems, um, staff retention, administrative burdens, um, theft, fraud, and liability, and payers' audits. And let me just underscore this, because this is a huge one for doctors. So for the very first time since the inception of Medicare, like 50 years ago, the amount of money paid to individual doctors by Medicare was disclosed. Not surprisingly, what they discovered was that a very few number of doctors were getting a disproportionate number of dollars from Medicare. And they thought, okay, well, these doctors are probably involved with some kind of theft or fraud. Let's target them. And these doctors may or may not be doing things unethically, like a lot of oncologists include the cost of chemotherapy. And if you're including that cost of medicine, well, it looks like you're getting more money than for purely services. So what happens is that a lot of doctors have been targeted. You know, doctor, you are guilty. And, you know, in the judicial system, you're innocent until proven guilty. When a doctor is being investigated, they're guilty until proven innocent. And this whole process of getting under scrutiny, getting under the magnifying glass is so painful that a lot of doctors come to think that they are guilty. So if they are outsourcing their billing to you, what that means is they know that they've got the checks and balances that are going to avoid the scrutiny, that are going to markedly decrease the risk that they're going to get audited. Yeah, and a lot of the services that our licensees can offer, in addition to the medical billing, uh, actually help the doctor with their compliance with HIPAA, for example, and uh, the audits that, that could come from Medicare. So we can even help them with those things specifically. Uh, I love this little graphic you came up with here. The status quo is no longer sustainable. That little hamster is probably how some doctors feel. 
they absolutely feel like that. And, you know, again, because doctors like business training, they don't look at a business challenge and think strategically, okay, well, if my cash flow is a problem, what can I do to solve it? And instead of thinking, well, gee, I could collect more, they're thinking about solutions like going to the bank and taking out a line of credit so that they know that they can meet payroll. So they're just trying to do the same thing, but faster and harder. And they've gotten to the point that that is no longer sustainable. They know that they need to do something differently. Yeah. And for many doctors, that something differently that really can transform them is outsourcing their billing. There's a great book that's come out called The One Thing. So if you want to transform something, what's like the one thing that you can do that's really going to transform your results? And for a doctor, that one thing is usually outsourcing their billing. Yeah, and we've uh, kind of pointed that out in in the book, the the new thriving medical practice. We've made that very clear th to the doctor. In fact, all we do is educate. People think that they have to go out and sell the doctor on this. No, they just need to see charts like I showed earlier, comparing what they spend in house. See, if you ask a doctor what what does it cost you to to process a, a medical claim, they'll probably just say, nah, what a dollar or two. I don't know, uh, but it's actually closer to twenty dollars for every one of those claims in house because they've got hidden overhead costs that they just don't think about. Patrick, you're so cute. Most doctors don't know how much they're billing, let alone how much it costs to send out an individual bill. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, if you ask a doctor what to, what kind of volume do you bill for, they would they would not have a clue, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay, here's our last question. Dr. Ragnar, what are some of the opportunities for me? Uh, talking about the people that are on the webinar today, what what opportunities are them, you know, out there in the medical uh, billing field? Well, like I said, as as a serial entrepreneur myself, I I ask certain questions like, is there a market? Is this market going to grow or go away? And is there a path to success? And what I can say with absolute certainty is that this is this is a great business opportunity. This is something that's real, that's growing, that's profitable. And by doing this, you're helping doctors thrive. I don't know if you ever wanted to be a doctor yourself, but I can tell you that if you are supporting a doctor and helping a doctor return to the joy of medicine, you've done a great job. You contributed to the world. Um, in addition, you know, you're you're fortunate enough to have connected with ABS. Now, I, I have no financial stake in ABS. Um, I associate with them because I want to, because this is an organization of integrity. And one of the great things about, you know, working with ABS rather than just like taking a job as a medical biller is that they have an ongoing commitment to your success. They want to see you thrive. So they've got systems to help you, you know, acquire doctor clients, become profitable and see a great return on the investment. So I would say that this is sort of a five star opportunity. And, you know, I'm so glad that you're here learning more about this. Well, by the way, uh, Dr. Vicki, I don't know if I've shared too much details with you even about this as a company, of course, with all transparency, I'm just sharing with people, I don't have to tell people this, but folks, we make money not just on your initial licensing and training and support fee that you pay, that's a one-time lifetime fee, but we also make money on the back end. A few pennies on each one of the transactions that goes through our system, through our clearinghouse, we make money on that as well. So we truly are partnering with people in business. So we become your partner and the more money you make, the more money we make. And that's the American way, right? <laughs> so it keeps us uh, excited and sharing new ideas. For example, last year, Dr. Vicki and I wrote this book together, The New Thriving Medical Practice. Now, let me get a copy of it here. Sorry, I, I know I'm not supposed to do this live, but uh, I've got a copy right here that has the, uh, the subtitle. Now, you may not can read it there on that slide unless you blow it up there on your screen. But look, we, we titled it, uh, How to Get Off the Hamster Wheel. There's your hamster. And uh, Work Smarter not harder, generate more revenue and enjoy greater satisfaction. 
in the post Obamacare era. So uh, that's what it's all about is helping doctors to, to thrive and want to stay in private practice because some of them are wanting to get out, aren't they? They sure are. Yeah. And go to work for, I guess, hospitals and other big groups. Now, look, this is a actually a marketing tool. Let's see if this one has it. Yeah. Look at the very bottom of the screen here where that arrow is pointing. You'll see that your name can actually be on the front cover with me and Dr. Ragnar. Yeah, there it is right there. Uh, forward by, and we've already written the forward. It's a very generic forward for the, for the book. But the great thing is, let me see. I think this also is on the next slide. It shows that your name would be on the title page right there beneath our names. And on the last page of the forward, it's a two-page forward. We're just showing you there that you can have your contact information right there in the book. So when you have this uh, as a, a handout, as a marketing tool, uh, when you give it to the doctor, you, you want to be sure and stick a little sticky note right here that opens up to that page and, and uh, shows that there's the contact information. So this is a marketing tool. Now, Dr. Ragnar, I think on uh, Amazon, we've got this for twenty four ninety five, dollars Isn't that what we have at the retail price? I believe but so. This, this is a bargain for $25, this book. Uh, but folks, this book you can have printed for our printing cost, which is around $4 a copy. And so it's a, it's a great uh, giveaway, a tool for that. Um, we also teach you during our live training workshop how to mark certain pages, highlight certain passages, uh, and stick little sticky tags like you see right there. So when you hand it to a doctor, they've never been given a book that's marked like that. They may not want to read an entire book, but they'll turn and, and see what you've got marked on those pages. And Dr. Vicki, we've had licensees give out, you know, copies of this and have the doctors call the next day and say, you know, I just flipped through your book there and I think I've got some problems that you could uh, help with. And yeah. Yeah. So just so you know, doctors don't want to work with a salesperson, right? They want to work with an expert. And I do not think that there is anything more compelling for expert positioning than having your name on the front of a book. So, you know, you are now the expert. Your name is now associated with me, a physician, and the most influential person in a doctor's life is another doctor. So yeah. we're sort of standing shoulder to shoulder approaching doctors and and that really makes you stand out from any of your competition yeah you are out there folks telling doctors that you're a part of the nation's largest network of medical revenue managers uh and and you can literally say in the corporate we sense that we process our network processes thousands of claims every day for hundreds of doctors from coast to coast and we collect millions of dollars uh in in revenue that the doctors would not collect otherwise. Like Dr. Ragnar said, they probably uh, write it off on their taxes at the end of the year. Well, believe me, if you ask a doctor, would you rather have that money in your bank account or, you know, write it off as a tax? They, they would take the money every time, I think. <laughs> now, there's another uh, book that we mentioned earlier. Uh, Dr. Ragnar, why don't you talk just a little bit about why you wrote this book and how the response across the country as you go out and speak uh, to different doctors groups uh, has been to this? Well, I th I'm a truth teller and, you know, everyone thinks that doctors are really rich, that they're doing well, that they've, you know, got a mansion and then a, you know, luxury summer home. But the reality is, is that half of doctors are not prepared for retirement. They don't know if and when they'll ever be able to stop practicing. So I was on vacation. I just heard yet another story. And so I zipped off a, a quick blog post called The Myth of the Rich Doctor. Well, when I got back home, I had discovered that this thing had gone viral. It had gotten picked up. People were calling me, asking me, could I come out and speak about this topic? And I thought, you know what? Whatever happened, I just hit a nerve. <laughs> and why don't I expand this into a book? And so I did. This was released about 12 months ago. And it's sort of taken the world of medicine kind of by storm. In October and November, I gave talks to eight different groups of doctors. So it was gone every week, those two months, and it just keeps on building. So I thought, well, if this is such a great tool, why not make this available as another marketing tool? So I am allowing um, the ABS licensees 
to purchase copies of this book at my cost also. So maybe you want to give the doctors two books or give them, you know, the thriving medical practice and then follow up with this book to just yeah. reinforce things. Um, so it's been an incredibly powerful tool for the, the people who are using it. And it was a surprise to me. I, I never would have expected that a little blog post would have led to something like this. Well, even the title is very intriguing for a doctor to say, wait a minute, somebody's written a book about the myth of the rich doctor. I have found out that it was a myth, <laughs> you know, myself. I'm, I'm not making the kind of money, at least I, I thought I would as a doctor. And right. like you said, even though they, some of them do make fairly decent money, especially the specialists out there, uh, it's not what they thought it was going to be because of all the regulations and the Medicare cutting back on payments and all those things, I guess. Oh, it's worse than that. It's just that it doesn't matter how much you make. If you spend more than you make, you're going to get in trouble. And let, let me tell you a story that actually drives this home. Um, so I heard the story of this man. He was an orthopedic surgeon who had like everything, the mansion, the summer home, luxury car, you know, luxury travel. Um, and after he completed his career, he went to law school and he tried medical malpractice lawsuit cases. The awards there are huge. So, you know, no wonder he could afford all of these things. But when he died, he discovered, the family discovered that he had left them nothing but debt. So, wow. It didn't wow. matter how it doesn't matter how much you make. So this book, and you're welcome. Patrick will tell you how to get a free copy of this book to read. Um, but it will just tell you that doctors just don't know the basics about how to promote financial health. And this book just lays out what we know about doctors and their relationship with money, and then what doctors can do to enjoy better financial health. So with Dr. Ragnar's permission, we've actually put a PDF copy of this book in the handout section just now. If you look over there in the handout section on the GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a PDF of that book that you can at least uh, get a feel for what she's actually uh, done out there to excite the doctors uh, about this whole uh, topic. Okay, well, uh, I'm gonna- Let me just mention that in there, when I talk about promoting uh, financial health. One of the things that I just expressly lay out is outsource your medical billing. So it's not you who's trying to promote, you know, your right. services. Now you've got a doctor who is saying, hey, look, this is a smart thing to do. I remember when I read the book and saw that quote, you know, I, I, I teach people to tag that that particular page and highlight it because, again, this is not us telling the doctor this, but another doctor. And like you said, they they think a whole lot more about you than they, they do us uh, as far as believability. So right. another great marketing tool that we've come up with here for you folks. Uh, we even, uh, she even has a way, Dr. Ragnar has a way that you can actually participate in the book and even have your name on the front cover as well. So you'll find out more about that when you come to our training class. But for now, I'll go ahead and get the PDF of it there. We stuck over there. Uh, Dr. Ragnar, I'll let you go here, but I, I do have one question that's come in. Uh, so let me uh, read this here from uh, Craig. He says, how does the electronic medical records conversion work for doctors who decide to use the ABS uh, services or our system? Now, you want to talk just a little bit then, and I'll, I'll address this specifically, but about electronic medical records and how important that is in today's medical world. Um, it, it's critical. Doctors are financially penalized if they do not adopt the electronic medical record. There are so many doctors who hate it enough that they're willing to pay the financial um, penalty for it. But what's gone on is that, you know, I think that the whole foundation of the healthcare system is the doctor patient relationship. And right. I don't know about you, but when I go and see my doctor, my doctor's not looking at me anymore. He's looking at the screen and he's typing. And I think that it is eroding the doctor patient relationship. So there yeah. are things that doctors are doing. Some doctors are hiring scribes. So they've got another person who's physically in the room documenting what's said. So doctors hate this electronic medical record, but it's here and it's here to stay. There, there's really no going back. 
No, and Kevin, to address, I mean, Craig, to, to address that specifically, uh, if the doctor already has an electronic record system, then sometimes they don't want to switch to ours. They can continue using that one and we'll tie that in with our billing system. Uh, but as you'll see, a lot of licensees have found that doctors, once they actually see ours, uh, they, they learn that they can use that uh, on an iPad right there in the doctor's office. It's all wireless, of course, and they're using that as they see the patient. So like Dr. Ratner said, instead of the doctor being turned away from you on a laptop or a computer, they're actually holding the, the, the iPad right there in front of them and looking at you and just tapping a few buttons as they have that interface with the patient. Much more personal. Yeah. Hey, by the way, Kevin, thank you. I saw that you typed in your name and uh, you're from Olep, uh, Kansas, and, and Tommy's from Bir Birmingham, Alabama. Now, folks, we've got a few more minutes that I'm going to stay on here. Dr. Ragnar, I appreciate so much your time today. This has been, it's always an honor for me to have you on here. And I know that the licensees and the prospective licensees love to hear from you because it's not old Patrick telling them things uh, that may or may not be true. <laughs> this is coming from you and and your experience means a whole lot, I'm sure, to them. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Patrick. All right. Thanks again. Bye for now. Bye-bye.